Hello, uh, my name is Eva Jablonka, and I'm going to tell you how Professor Ginsburg and I applied a methodology which was developed by Tibor Ganti to the problem of life. Tibor Ganti was a Hungarian uh, chemist who tried to define and to build a, a model of minimal life. And the way he went about it was to compile a kind of consensus list of the capacities that, are gen that would generally be recognized as characterizing life, and then uh, build a model that is based, that links all these capacities together, and find a single, a single capacity of the system that when it is in place, it implies that the whole list is also in place. So a single capacity that is like a diagnostic marker. We called this, Simona Ginsburg and I called this the evolutionary transition marker. In his case, it is the evolutionary transition marker for life. And we were looking, using this kind of way of thinking, this kind of methodology, for a marker for minimal consciousness. We wanted to apply this methodology to the question of consciousness. We search for such a marker because a single tractable capacity that can identify minimal kind of life or consciousness can not only tell us which creatures are, which beings are alive or conscious, but can also tell us how, which processes and which structures actually construct this capacity. So here is the idea of a transition marker. What Ganti did for the question of the origin of life was to find a list of capacities that everyone would agree that if they exist, that if they are displayed by some kind of being, they are markers of, in his case, life. It can be a list of capacities that are characteristic of something like consciousness. So it is something that has to be sufficient for us to say, yes, if somebody has this list of capacities, this being is alive, conscious, or if we're thinking about rationality, rational. And then the, the next stage is to find a single tractable capacity that when it exists, we know that the whole list is in place. This is the kind of methodology that we applied. So we started with a list of capacities. Now, the list of capacities that we see here at the bottom is quite elaborate, and I'm not going to go into a detailed description of each of them. But basically, we are looking for several very, very important and we believe diagnostic capacities. Not only we believe it, but many other people believe it. So for example, conscious creatures perceive a composite object or a composite action as an integrated whole. For example, we see the apple as both red and round and of a smooth texture. And this allows us to make discrimination. For example, a peahen can discriminate among peacocks that differ subtly in the color and pattern of their tails. A mouse can discriminate between edible and inedible seeds, for example. In order for this to, ha to happen also, we need to have some kind of capacity to bring together information from different cognitive systems from sensory systems, from a memory system, from value system, and to bind them together so that comparisons and discriminations and generalizations and evaluations will become possible. We also have to hold on to, uh, to incoming information. For a conscious being, the present is not a kind of infinitely small in point of intersection between past and future. It has duration. It is experience as a duration. A conscious being can evaluate goals. It can evaluate its perceptions. It can evaluate its own action. And it can change its evaluations according to circumstances. It has this kind of flexibility. It can also selectively exclude or amplify certain signals coming from its own body and coming from the world. So there is a lot of selective attention. There is an ability to focus attention, to sustain attention, to shift attention that conscious beings all have. Very, very importantly, and this is related to all the other things too, a conscious being not only integrates information, it maps signals from the world and the body and creates kind of maps 
cognitive maps. And one example of this are the kind of spatial maps that are formed by birds, by bats, by rats. And these maps are also called representations. And these representations must be implemented in a body that is not just reactive, but is intrinsically active, proactive. And it has the ability to have a stable kind of perspective which can discriminate between the same stimuli that come from the world and the body. So the nature of the stimulus is very much dependent and how you react to it is very much dependent on where it comes from. For example, if you tickle yourself or you are tickled, your reaction is very different, although the sensory stimulus per se can be exactly the same. Now, this list, as I told you, is not complete, and, and some people think that some aspects of it are more important and some aspects of it are less important. And obviously, all the kind of characteristics that I was talking about are related to each other. And this is very important because they sort of imply each other, facilitate each other, enable each other, and so on. They form a system. But the most important thing is that if we found something a being like that has all these capacities on another planet, most researchers, most psychologists, most neurobiologists, most cognitive psychologists would say, well, we have to take into very seriously the possibility that this being is conscious. We will treat it with respect. It is very difficult to investigate and identify each of this long list of capacities that I was talking about. So we were looking for a single capacity that requires that this whole list is in place. And after a lot of work, we found one capacity. And this capacity is a capacity which we called the capacity for unlimited associative learning. It's a form of learning, I will explain in a minute, which is recursive, generative, and domain general. And it requires that the creature can represent, remember, and evaluate goals, their predictive cues, and the ways of reaching them. And the way that this capacity is actually operationalized is when a creature can do discrimination learning, so it can do multimodal sensory integration that allows it to do discrimination learning. It can integrate over time, and this in the learning and this can be represented by trace conditioning. That is, the animal can learn that a predictive cue, that a particular cue is predictive of reinforcement, reward, or of punishment, even if there is a time gap between the predictive cue or between the action, its own action, and the reward or the punishment. So it, they don't have to overlap. They don't have to be synchronous. A third thing is flexible value system so that the animal can learn that something that was good in environment one is bad in environment two and vice versa. For example, a little mouse can learn that a particular route that it was using is no longer safe because the environment has changed. So when an animal or a being is able to do all these things, it enables it to display very flexible and goal-directed behavior, which is based on subjectively experienced perceptions and motivations. And this gives us a clue as to the function of consciousness. William James said that consciousness is a fighter for ends, of which many, but for its presence, would not be ends at all. So the function of consciousness is to be able to reach goals that change all the time, and the goals are evaluated through the perceptions and motivations of an organism, its internal states, as they interact and map its own actions and the external world. Now, we hypothesized that this kind of system, the ability to learn in this system, is dependent on reciprocal connections between sensory, motor, reinforcement, and memory processing unit with the central unit at the core of the network. You see it here, this is the purple kind of unit. And we think that in the nervous system, this kind of architecture, of course, this is a very, very simplistic picture, is implemented in the central nervous system in animals. And this leads us to pr a prediction about the relationship between if we're right, and this is actually, this kind of learning is really a marker of minimal consciousness, then the prediction is that this type of learning can be manifest only 
when animals are actually conscious of the predictive stimuli of their own actions. If an animal is presented with stimuli subliminally, it will not be able to learn them. It can only be able to learn them when it is absolutely conscious of them. On the other hand, simpler forms of learning can be accomplished by the animal, even if they're presented subliminally. And so far, at least in humans, this kind of predictions have been borne out. And also there are some experiments in monkeys that also support this. And I'm very glad to say that people are beginning to look at this question also in other species. Not only in, not only in mammals, not only in humans. So we have predictions as to the nature of learning that can happen under subliminal and supraliminal conditions. Now, if we're right, and unlimited associative learning is really a marker of consciousness, and unlimited associative learning is something that we can actually study. We can see which animal or animals or creatures or any kind of, of thing can actually accomplish this kind of learning. And we looked for quite a long time to see which animals are capable of this kind of learning. And we found out that it is only animals and only a very small number of phyla among the animals. There are only three phyla of animals that are capable of the display the capacity for unlimited associative learning. And this group of animals are the vertebrates, some arthropods, including some insects and including crabs, lobsters, shrimps, and the cephalopods, the coleoid cephalopods, which include the squid, the octopus, and the cuttlefish. Now, we also know what kind of brain, what kind of nervous system we want. We can ask, okay, we, this, do, do these animals have the supporting structures in the nervous system that actually enable this form of learning? And what are they? We know that they must have them because they have this form of learning. So we can identify them and we can compare them between the different species. And when we do that, we find something very, very interesting. The brain structures in mammals, here we have a human being, this is Spinoza, and his brain on the left, we have a dragonfly and its brain on the right, and we have a, at the bottom an octopus hiding in a coconut shell and its brain. And when the brains of mammals and the brains of insects were compared, they are very, very different. Of course, all these three brain types are very, very different structurally. Nevertheless, they have a very a similar functional brain architecture. So in the middle, you see the mammalian and the insect brain architecture, and they are surprisingly similar. They have the same type of functional units and the same type of connections among functional units. We know a little bit less about the cephalopods, but we are learning more. We see that they too have the same kind of functional units. So vertebrates, arthropods, and coleoid cephalopods have the UAL supporting brain structures. And since, since we have fossil brains also, we can find in the fossil uh, record traces of brains, of, of brain structures. We can figure out when these structures first appeared in the fossil record. And when we look at that, we find out that UAL first appeared in the Cumbrian 542 million years ago in two groups, in the vertebrates and the arthropods. And it appeared about 250 million years later in the coleoid cephalopods. So what you see in this diagram is the Cumbrian, what is known as the Cumbrian explosion. It is a relatively short period of time, about 60 million years, where almost all the known pile of animals appeared. That's why it's called the Cumbrian explosion. It was like an explosion of life. It's something that gave Darwin quite a lot of trouble because he was always talking about gradual evolution. And here was a very, very sudden burst of evolutionary novelties. And during this period, we see the brain structures in the vertebrates and in the arthropods that are indicative of the capacity for UAL and by implication, minimal consciousness. So the next question that we asked was, okay, these two groups appears at that time, another group uh, appeared 250 million years ago. This suggests to us that there were at least probably three beginnings. There were three independent 
transitions to consciousness and transitions to UAL. This happened three times in parallel, possibly. And it also gave us the idea that since the vertebrates and the arthropods appeared in the Cumbrian, maybe, and because unlimited associative learning is such a powerful adaptation, it allows individuals to learn about the many, many aspects in, uh, of the environment during their own lifetime and adapt during their own lifetime, maybe this capacity for unlimited associative learning was one of the things that actually drove the Great Cumbrian explosion. Because when you have this capacity to learn, you exert a huge uh, selection pressure on the species with which you interact and on the individuals in your own species in which you interact. So predators become more effective predators. Prey becomes more evasive prey. Mates become more discriminating and so on and so forth. So evolution can become very, very rapid and it can lead to the kind of explosion that we see. We're not saying that this is the only reason for this Cumbrian explosion. There's many interacting reasons, but we suggest that this was one of the engines that drove this great transition in this great uh, diversification of life. So what we see here is the kind of creatures that appear in the Cumbrian, mainly it was dominated by arthropods, but there were also small fish during the Cumbrian explosion. There was a kind of great war for existence, a great battle for existence that occurred, which was driving evolutionary interactions among species and driving huge diversification of species, leading to both antagonistic and cooperative arms races and many, many feedbacks. Now, this led to a lot of the things that we see. If we're thinking about, for example, the beautiful patterns on the body of the male fish or the haunting uh, songs of birds and all this the kind of uh, patterning that we see in the world or the patterns of flowers, this kind of thing would not have evolved were it, were it not for creatures being able to discriminate them among them. So, for example, in this case, the beautiful patterns on the male fish would not evolve if it wasn't for the female's ability to discriminate between different patterns and choose among them. So I don't think we would have beauty without consciousness, for example. And it's very important to remember that although we're talking about consciousness and about the origins of consciousness and about simple consciousness, this was just the beginning of an evolutionary process that went on. Consciousness and learning became more complex during evolution. So when I was describing this very simple consciousness, the consciousness that is underlined by unlimited associative learning, this type of learning self-evolved. And animals that are able to be conscious not only of encoding information in the present, but also be conscious of past information of the past and can be conscious of a future state of the world, of virtual realities, have also evolved. And this is the, the evolution of imagination and of planning. Past memories and future possibilities have become conscious in some animals, for example, in elephants and in corvids. And finally, we reach the human uh, species, our own lineage, where we have reflective consciousness. And this is the ability not only to imagine and to plan, but also to communicate about the products of our imagination, to share them, to analyze them to rationalize them, to categorize them. Thank you very much.